Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Today, we're going to speak with a person who is probably the leading attorney in the United States and helping to defend freedom of choice for parents who do not want to engage with mandatory vaccines. His name is Alan Phillips. Alan, I've interviewed several times, and the, the reasoning is that if they're going to go after the person who is considered the best in the field, and he ha- is probably the best exclusively practicing vaccine exemption and waiver law, and individual and legal rights on vaccination policies, then they're going after him to send a message to everyone else. So we're inviting him on to hear his story and see what we can do to protect him and also seek justice. Needless to say, this is where all of the citizen activist journalists can come in after you hear what he has to say and who's against him. We can expose those people and will. Also today, part two of global warming, we're screwed. My newest um, article, along with Richard Gale, on this topic, and it's different. I Today, what you'll hear is completely original, different perspective on how to deal with the environment. I have not seen, heard anyone talk about this in the past, yet this is the This is the 1,200-pound grill in the room that no one is acknowledging. And if time permits, I'll also be addressing uh, one of the two callers about shouldn't we at least understand that it's better to have someone like Hillary Clinton as president than Donald Trump, so the lesser of two evils should get an exemption, a pass. Okay, that's one of our listeners' perspective. I'll share my points of view. We always begin with the latest on health and healing. From West Virginia University, a group of scientists were studying how to improve certain biomarkers of cellular aging and Alzheimer's disease. And they published the results in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And it's about experiencing memory loss. And they found that you can improve memory, cognition, sleep, mood, and quality of life with these biomarkers. They looked at 60 older adults with cognitive decline, and that's a condition that may represent a preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, and this is a randomized clinical trial. And by the way, what is very frustrating for those experiencing cognitive decline is you don't remember what you forgot. As a result, Someone can say, I didn't say that. Yeah, you did. No, I'm, I'm certain I didn't. No, you said it every minute for the last 20 minutes. And they look at you. They think that somehow you're disconnected from reality, and it's, no, this is what happens. They can have the same conversation multiple times. They can forget that they've shared something with you or done something. It can get really bad. I'll tell you how bad. A close friend of mine a very well-known person, a very loved person. He's just, he's just very thoughtful, um, always has been. I've known him my whole professional career. We kind of started off together. Met at a Park Avenue um, party where someone was trying to reintroduce after 30 years the old Gertrude Stein salons of Paris where you'd have Hemingway and, and D.H. Lawrence, whoever you would have. Well, it wouldn't have been D.H. Lawrence at that point. But you would have had some remarkable individuals. And uh, we had, at any given party, about 15, sometimes as many as 20 people. But you'd only have one person who would cover a given area. If it was history or an adventurer who had traveled around the world and gone to some remote country and brought back interesting insights, if it was a linguistic expert. But these were formidable intellects. I was always in, just in awe of how deep their 
thinking went. And it was always hosted by wonderful, exuberant, optimistic uh, former debutante who had the good fortune to have enough resources to have an apartment that we could all have dinner in. Drugs were absolutely forbidden. If you got drunk, you were never invited again. Uh, vulgarity was not uh, acceptable. As one woman said when someone went on a rant once, I think it was Norma Mailer. Anyhow, um, she said, um, the Marx Brothers are funny. And they're funny because they are they found a way around the Hayes censorship rules by just being more clever. So if, if you want to say something that uh, offends us, say something offensive. If you want to say something that entertains us, enlightens us, say it in a way that does not offend us. I thought that always stuck in my, my mind because I started seeing some comedians go from being very clever, and I really appreciated their humor, just being vulgar. And if the only way you can get someone's attention, and that's what I see now with all these political comedians, they're not funny. Am I the only one noticing? They're just not Colbert. None of these people are funny. They try to be ironic. They try to be insightful. Well, first you have to have an intellect before you do that, and they just don't. They're Choose another career, because that ain't working. In any case, that's where we met, and this person would talk about art. And uh, I'll tell you what kind of guy he is. He heard on a radio program that while going to a slaughtering plant, a cow jumped out of a back of a van, ran across a highway, jumped through a fence, and was hiding in some trees. So they went to get him. And so he made a call. And he said, don't kill that cow. Any creature that wants to live that bad deserves a life. So they exploited it. I think they charged him thirty thousand dollars for this cow, which would have gone for about a thousand bucks. He paid it and then gave it a life on a farm he had upstate. His whole nature was that way. Anyhow, he now has dementia. And it's extremely frustrating because he won't remember that we just had dinner. Unfortunately, um, not in a situation, and this is often the case, fully supported by family to reverse this using natural techniques, which leads me to a larger issue. I'm going to guess about 95% of the people that I counsel throughout my career have not had the support of their family members. In some cases, it has been their family member one family member who did support them, but the others negated it. There's a very famous French director, one of the top five French directors in cinematic history in France. His son came to me at Tri-State Healing Center, and uh, he listened to the show, and he read my work, and he said, I very much want you to help my father uh, with his cancer. So we spent about four hours going over all the protocols, and just so happened that evening, there were some people with cancer, who I said, why don't you go speak with them? Why don't you go speak with some of the physicians? And he did. And he was very optimistic. He said, wow. He said, I spoke with this woman. She had end-stage breast cancer and going into hospice care. And now, 14 months later, there's no cancer in her body. She's doing this preventatively. And who would have known? I said, well, she knows now. Now you know. I didn't hear from him for about eight weeks going walking by Lincoln Center Plaza one night, the movie theater. There he is. And he comes over, he says, I'm, I'm so frustrated because his wife refuses to even think about alternative therapy, and yet he's terminal. I said, well, look at it like this. He knows he's terminal. Everyone in his family knows he's terminal. He's seeing his friends and family because he's terminal. You may not see him again. What does anyone have to lose? There's no downside. If he's going to die, he's going to die. Why not try something where there's a reasonable chance that he could improve or reverse it? And there was that family member who said no, and said no with an attitude. 
So I fully understand those of you who do not have a support system to help you when you need it the most because they're conditioned to believe that anything other than what their doctor says cannot possibly work because if it, something did work, their doctor would surely know about it. Hmm. We have an audio clip. There are four physicians, all board certified, one from Sloan Kettering, a professor, another one of America's top pain specialists, and their mother and father, she's a board certified radiologist, former professor, and his father's also a uh, board certified physician. Four in one family. They came to see what is possible. They left with a whole new mindset. What would happen if we actually had open civil discourse of allowing different points of view to be shared and challenged, as they should be? But we don't have that at this time. I'm writing an article on it. It'll be done in the next couple of weeks, and I'll share it with you. Anyhow, the good news is, if you do something this simple, this simple, you can actually impact the beta amyloid in the brain, and you can also help by stimulating some of these markers. And this is over a three-month period. And one is the length of the telomere, telo, T-E-L-O, mer, M-E-R-E. The longer that is, and the more active the telomerase enzyme is, and telomerase serves as a protective cap on chromosomes, and telomerase is an enzyme responsible for the maintaining the telomere's length. So when you do good things, like having a plant-based diet, taking your supplements, alcarnosine, al- resveratrol, pycnogenol, NAD, PPQ, etc., you actually keep it long. When you exercise, you really keep it long. So the more you exercise on a regular basis, the longer you exercise over your lifetime, the longer your telomeres, the more active your telomerase. Hence, what they found is these simple things improve memory, cognition, function, stress, sleep, mood, and quality of life. And this was followed up for a total of six months. So this was just in three months. Wow. So you see, there is hope. And this was in a major study, Western University, published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. But do you think this is going to filter down? No, it won't. But it's for you to know because you can actually use it. From Wake Forest Medical Center, an article published in the Journal of Neuroscience, mindfulness meditation beats a placebo in pain reduction. So just being mindful, sitting. And you don't have to get in a lotus position and close your eyes and hold your thumb and forefinger and go, oh, 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 blah, blah, blah. No, you don't. You can just take a walk in the park. You can go sit by a a stream, look out at the ocean. You can look at a group of trees. You can watch children playing. You can look at a, and just stroke your, the the neck and the head and the, the chest of your dog, cat. Simple things, but keep your mind focused on that. In other words, don't have the television on, don't be talking on the telephone. Just mindfulness. Be mindful of where your mind is. And that can help reduce pain. And that's important. Also today, they found that from Tufts University, published in the Peer Review Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry, that feeding cranberries reduces the low-fiber, animal-based diet effects on gut health. Now, why is this important? Because we're not always able to change everything at the time we need to or have others change what is important for them in their diet. So how many times have you had friends or family continue to eat the wrong foods, be angry at you for eating the right foods or suggesting they change, and then they get sick? So this study, which is unique, shows that cranberries have a protective effect on your gut microbiome. Micro, M-I-C-R-O, biome, B-I-O-M-E. 
That is the colonization of good bacteria in your gut. So if they are eating unhealthy foods, this helps mitigate some of that low fiber, unhealthy, and therefore keeps your bacteria healthy. And why? Because cranberries are found to have what is a bioacids and also impacting short chain fatty acids in the gastrointestinal tract. And they also have anti carcinogenic effects. So they're really good. And from the Calico Life Sciences, published in the Peer Review Journal Genetics, genetics has less impact on lifestyle than once believed. We've been saying this the whole time. And the reason I can say it with some sense of authority is because I remember two sisters. They were in their 20s, and this goes back to about 1985, more or less. They looked completely healthy, but they had tested for the genes that predict breast cancer. Therefore, their doctors had suggested radical mastectomies preventatively. And they wanted another input, and so I said, let's just say that, that it's correct. You do have a gene that predicts cancer, but the science does not actually support that. And I showed him the challenge to that science. But I said, but let's say they're right. They're assuming, because of their monotheistic, monolithic brains, single thoughts, nothing else matters, nothing else counts. Boy, have I seen that a million times that it doesn't matter what you eat or drink or how you feel or where you work or where you live or what your environmental influences are or your conditioning. None of that pays any, any, uh, any power to the outcome. But what if it did? Wouldn't it be better to make some changes that protect you from the genetic consequence if it can be proven the genetic consequence is absolute? They said, yeah. So we started a one-year program for one year every single day. They did everything that I could possibly um, encourage them to do that would change the underlying genetic consequence. At the end of a year, they tested absolutely healthy, and those biomarkers no longer showed any potential for cancer. So we can change genetic predisposition in many, many conditions. So now they're saying this in genetics and, quote, uh, Graham Ruby of Calico Life Sciences and Colleagues, which concludes that estimates of the heritability of longevity in humans, quote, are substantially inflated. Heritability is a measure of how much a variation in a trait can be explained by genetic differences as opposed to lifestyle and other factors. We can potentially learn many things about the biology of aging from human genetics, but if the heritability of lifespan is low, its tempers are, it tempers our expectations about what types of things we can learn and how easy it will be. It helps contextualize the questions that scientists studying aging can effectively ask. <clears throat> okay, they looked at 400 million people in a database, online genealogy, uh, ancestry, to determine this. Here is what they're finally intimating. Everything you do will impact your genes, constructively or destructively. Just look at the people in your graduating class from high school or college, if you've been living a healthy life and they have not. So that's one way that you can look at it. If you have done everything possible or reasonable to impact in a good way your genes, you should have a good gene profile today. And your genes should then have had you looking younger, stronger, more vital, more energy than those who did not. And you can actually take, well, you know, it's in the family, it's in the gene pool, so, you know, what am I expecting? And you can actually then 
speed up the genetic consequences by doing negative things. So do not believe when people say, well, it's in your genes, yeah? So there's a lot of stuff you don't know, and I'm still here, and that's what you tell them. And by the way, finally, from D'Annuso University in Italy, they've just come up with a study that shows that 95% a plaque buildup, which is deadly for your heart, it's the number one cause of death in the nation, can be mitigated, lowered, with pine bark and goda cola. Goda, G-O-T-U, cola, K-O-L-A. And pine, pine bark is also known as pycnogenol. How about that? And I know a lot of you have been using these rich in proanthice additins, bioflavonoids, phenolic acids, and the French pine bark extract reduces the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines that trigger inflammation and plaque formation. Therefore, take your go to cola and take your pine bark and help inhibit the formation of plaque, which reduces the adhesion of the cells that contribute to atherosclerosis. I'm Gary Nall. That's the latest in health and healing. We're going to take a brief break. We're 22 minutes into our program. Come back, and we're going to go right into George Carlin answering. No, I'm going to hold that. Hold that. I'm going to come back, and we're going to take a look at part two of my critique on the environment, where we're at, where we're going, and why we should rethink everything. Back in a moment. Nice to have you with us, everyone. I'm Gary Nall. I want to mention that there are a lot of things happening around the world that I'm very concerned about. This is just one, and I want to share this with you because this is nowhere else in the media. This is from Climate News, from Alex Kirby. It says, A group of British scientists and their supporters are willing to risk a prison term to press governments to tackle climate change and environmental crisis. It says a growing number of British academics, writers, and activists say they are ready to go to prison in support of their demands for action on the environment. Scientists are not normally renowned for their political activism, and the United Kingdom is hardly a hotbed of determined and risky protests against its rulers. But if this group of nearly 100 British scientists and their backers is right, all that may be on the brink of changing. Today sees the launch of the Extinction Rebellion, which describes itself as an international movement using mass civil disobedience to force governments to enter a World War II level mobilization mode in response to climate breakdown and ecological crisis. The group is launching a declaration of rebellion against the United Kingdom's government, quote, for criminal inaction in the face of climate change catastrophe and ecological collapse at the House of Parliament um, in, let's say, in central London. And from today, it promises repeated acts of disruptive, nonviolent civil disobedience if the government does not respond seriously to its demands and says there will be mass arrest. Now is the time because we are out of time. There is nothing left to lose. Good for them. I commend them. That takes a great deal of courage to stand up, especially to a government that never listens to its people, that has its own political agenda, as does the United States. And yesterday I began a, a two-part series called Global Warming, We're Screwed, and then subtitled The Optimists and Utopians, The Pragmatist, The Pessimist, and The Nihilist. 
Each one of these groups has its own perspective. And I specifically addressed David Corton, who does a good job over at Yes Magazine, in discussing how modern civilization's power to wake up and make critical changes is necessary to either lessen the impact of climate change or reverse its course. Now, Corton is not alone. There are others as well. And all of these other people are saying we need a Marshall Plan to save the planet. Nothing less will do. I agree. We do need a Marshall Plan. I also agree that it's a noble gesture. And I fully support it. And what happens is if we don't agree, then we reduce ourselves to apathy, indifference, and fear that climate change instills in billions of people who are experiencing environmental catastrophes. So you have Michael Mann, Bill McKibben, and many others who want to see change. On the other hand, there is a growing faction of people whose awareness has expanded. And I mentioned that people are living off the grid now. They are finding environmental communities. They're finding how to do things they never thought they would have to do, learning new ways, like there's Paul Beckwith, Kevin Hester, Guy McPherson, Natalia Shakova. And these are people who are saying, we're going elsewhere. You know, when the time comes, we'll be relocated. And that brings me to the idea that I believe that we will be seeing the largest immigration or migration in the United States' history because of the environment. Primarily, it will be around the coast from, and I'm including Canada and, of course, Vancouver, beautiful city, but it's going to get creamed. And then Washington State and Oregon and California, all of California, and then continue around the whole Gulf Coast, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. And Florida is going to have a double negative, both hurricanes, flooding, toxic tides, because the largest lake in the state, Lake Okeechobee, is getting, getting so much rainfall, and it's all toxic from the pesticides, that it has to open the gates and allow it to go to the east coast, up around Port St. Lucie and on the west coast, or Juniper, and then on the west coast over uh, up near um, north of Fort Lauderdale. But then it migrates up and down the whole coast. Now, right now as I speak, the entire coast is just completely saturated with green algae and then red algae and toxic water and no oxygen in the water and millions of fish and thousands of mammals are, are dying. So you go clear up the east coast of the United States. These are the areas that are most susceptible. Then you go to the interior where you have Colorado, Kansas, Illinois, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico. These are also non-sustainable for the future. So we now have a dilemma. Our dilemma is, are we willing to risk personal change in our lifestyle, our buying habits, changing our capitalist model of continuous growth as the only metric of how we're progressing. Oh, we have 3.5 to 4.1 um, gross domestic growth in the last, uh, in the consumer index in the last uh, two quarters. That's good. Not for the planet. It means more things are being sold, more people are using things. Many of those things they're using, more of their stuff is simply finite in resources. And then you have the people who are simply indifferent. If it's not happening to them, they're not going to make it an issue. And here is the dilemma of achieving and adhering to irrationally idealistic attitudes. It is my belief that the majority of private industries that fuel economic growth depend upon and are powered by the very same fossil fuel addiction that drives climate change. We are therefore forced to demand that all of the largest polluters change their entire paradigm of business as usual and invest in long-term sustainability immediately. 
And because no one is going to do that, not a single industry, and no politician that's received money from their lobbyists or front groups are going to demand that they make these changes, they'll make it voluntary. That was what Obama was good at, smiling, waving, shooting a basketball, and getting everyone to say, isn't he nice? He looks so presidential. Yeah, well, he just gave all the industries an out. Make it voluntary, but act like you did something. He didn't. No one did anything good in the last five administrations concerning the environment. So what we have is we're not changing. Fossil fuels have been the engine driving manufacturing and the quality of life that is taken for granted in developed nations. So to change this paradigm, you're going to have to change the way we look at politics, of financing, who's going to pay for all this, and who's willing to make the changes. Now the facts are crystal clear. The past several years have taught us that Perpetual drought and more frequent wildfires in the Pacific coastal and northwestern states are here to stay. In your lifetimes, you'll never go back to normal. Southern states have been battered by Category 4 and higher hurricanes. All the science points to more extreme weather events and conditions as the planet's surface warms. It's very likely that another Category 5 superstorm this year or next year, will result in the largest human migration in modern American history. Following Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Michael, homeowners are realizing their insurance is not covering what they believed they were paying for. I can tell you because my insurance company, where I paid my premiums for 24 years, and the only time I asked them to cover damage from the last hurricane, they offered me 3%. That's it. Take it or leave it. Well, I said, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm not leaving it. And now we're in court over it. So you have to understand that the insurance company is not there to protect you. They're there to make a profit. And they're going to do everything they can to diminish how much you get. And you have to look at your policies. Because if you're covered for hurricane but not water damage, when your roof is blown off and hundreds of thousands of gallons of water saturate your house, none of that is covered. People are not aware of their own policies. As a result, millions of people are now facing financial ruin, and the only asset they had was the investment in their homes, and now that's plummeting. So insurance companies are going to stop insuring, and where they have to, they're going to raise the premiums, and people are going to be impacted, and they're going to have to move. Unfortunately, we are not making any effort to help the average person. We're not preventing anything. My greatest disappointment has been observing the U.S. regress into the most self-absorbed, narcissistic, and selfish citizenry on the planet. There are always exceptions, absolutely but they seem to be progressively becoming a minority. Poe after Poe indicates that concerns about climate change pale in comparison to the desires for economic growth and national security from imaginary terrorists. After almost 50 years of counseling people about their health conditions, even after heart attacks and strokes and cancer, and providing the best advice I can based on quality, hard scientific evidence, I watched people continue to resist making fundamental changes even when their lives depend upon it. So even as sea levels rise and superstorms worsen, people will continue to rebuild along coastal regions while believing they are entitled to a pleasant climate and a normal life. Deep down, I believe they understand the laws of cause and effect, that there are consequences to unchecked growth that no one can get something for nothing. But most people secretly believe they're going to be the exception to the rule. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that there are approximately 61 million Americans in the professional class. Now, this is a substantial increase over my last numbers, and these are actually new numbers just yesterday. That will include engineers and higher management, architects and physicians and computer and IT specialists and psychologists and 
diverse scientists and, and researchers and academics and clergy, etc. And according to some wealth analysis, this includes close to 11 million millionaires as of 2017. Over 90% of millionaires are married with families. Taking into account family size, this means then that where my old figures were 112 million very wealthy or constantly consuming people, we're now up to 181 million people. So forget the 1%. We're dealing with 181 million. That's over 50% of the American population, including 33 million living in ridiculous wealth. The latter group considers themselves among the privileged elite. To understand the economic obstacles thwarting any viable climate change initiative, we can ask a simple question. Who amongst this privileged elite will agree to downsize their lifestyle to help reverse human greenhouse emissions and preserve the environment? The United States has never been before so polarized into two economic classes competing with each other. The professional careerists who are highly educated, work hard, and carry enormous debt exist in sharp contrast to the remainder of the nation that struggles to make ends meet, living from paycheck to paycheck. Having participated in or organized and led dozens of demonstrations over the years, I've noticed that it is the average working person who will go to the streets and protest. Rarely have I ever seen the professional class, with some exceptions, certainly none from the rank and file of the wealthy elite. Yet with a future set for more artificial intelligence technologies, and if you don't think that's a problem, oh, it is. It is a big problem, masterfully done. Edward Bernay could not have duplicated how clever the new people are at marketing. Turn on the television. Turn on the lights. What's the temperature? What's the population of Ottawa? I'm going to travel today. What is the fastest route to get every single thing you could ask? Instantly, it's answered. That's artificial intelligence. That's the soft side. We don't need vacuum cleaners. This little thing runs around the room and picks up hair and dust, etc., and then parks itself and recharges itself. How about that? Why go out and get into a relationship to have sex you may not like or may be interesting, and then it's over because it was really the bait? Now you got what you didn't plan on. Two strangers looking for the missing part of each other after the sex wears down. Not to worry. We have Ed. Now, how big do you want Ed? You can make me any size. Do you want him to cuddle? He will. Do you want him with a beard? Okay. Or mustache? No. Clean shaven? He's got that. Stubble? Perfect. You want him 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", 6'5"? What color do you want him? What's his hair? Length? What do you want his breath to smell like? Fruit? What do you want? Perfect teeth? Always cuddling? Transhumanism? Yeah. And then you can have Debbie. And this isn't Debbie Does Dallas. This is Debbie Does Anything, always with a smile and an intellect. What kind of intellect you got, Debbie? Well, I've got the cumulative knowledge of every woman that's ever written a book and ever gave a speech in world history. Therefore, I'm the smartest woman that's ever lived. Not saying a lot for you, but whatever you can talk about, I can do it better. Hmm. Well, that's a challenge. But Debbie and Ed are real manifestations in existence now as we speak. And what about all those chips? There's a big push right now, I'm sure you've seen it, about getting your getting your chip. So this way you don't have to worry about, oh, I forget my keys. Walk up to a door, your car door, your office door, your home, and it automatically opens. Go to your computer, forget your pass- password, automatically turns on. Everything you need to know. I forgot a phone number. Mention a person's name and suddenly the number is there. All you have to do is just have the chip implanted. It's just the size of a seed. Hmm. Okay. That seems harmless enough. Wow, that makes my life convenient. You are aware there's a 
million other codes that can go into that seed. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So every single thing you're doing in your life, everything you think, everything you feel, everything you eat, it will be reporting back. No, I didn't know that. They didn't sell that part of it. They never do. So just imagine a population has gotten so lazy, expects so many services done for it, that now you expect everything to be done and there's always someone from Silicon Valley providing you with that instant gratification. Now, it may mean you don't have a job anymore, but hey, as long as I've got all this stuff, who cares? More time for porn, right? Oh, you don't need porn anymore, lonely person. No, as long as you can afford one of these transhumans, you've got a companion and it does whatever you want. Wow, what could possibly go wrong there? How about everything? So what we're seeing today is we're seeing these highly educated people who are now going to be losing their jobs. Here's the irony. Want to know a real bitter irony? Historically, it was the poorest that lost their jobs first. Last hired, first fired. Now it's the most highly educated losing their job because now there's higher educated work visas, automation, offshoring. Once economically secure, families are now starting to sink into the ranks of the new poor. Both classes are fully capable of agreeing that the environment is a defining problem that they will agree upon, if not the defining problem of our time. But there is a most a nominal overlap between those capable of making a change and those in whom making a change will have an impact on their surroundings. This realization came home to me recently after a conversation with a prominent Wall Street financial planner. Over the last 30 years, he's counseled over a thousand clients in the multi-million dollar class. And he told me something. He said, Gary, something's happening and boy, is it unusual. I said, what is it? He says, I'm witnessing for the first time in my career, people not asking for my advice but rather asking me, will I sell their assets, antiques, designer clothing, jewelry, paintings, art, etc.? I said, why? Because all these people who are earning millions, they're spending every penny of it and more. They need cash. These same wealthy individuals are speculating on un, under unprecedented levels at margins of 100%, meaning they're betting on something and they don't have the money. They're hoping that what they bet on wins so they can use the proceeds to pay down their margin calls. But it doesn't work that way in the real world. They all believe they can beat the system. They watched two big to fell banks bounce back stronger than ever after the 2008 crash that should have killed them. They've seen hedge funds and equity partnerships, the economic parasites of society, creep piles of money out of nothing, enriching their owners beyond their wildest dreams. This hyper-consumption model has become the new American dream, the province of an emerging professional elite that lives off debt in order to maintain a lifestyle that is no longer within their means to sustain. They live artificial lives solely to preserve artificial appearances in an artificially intelligent society that bases itself upon artificial appearances. Private sector debt is astronomical. If the U.S. debt clock is accurate, Americans' total personal debt is $19 trillion. Personal debt. That's $15 trillion in mortgage debt alone. What do you think the value of the property is going to be when you are caught in an area where it's no longer sustainable and you're susceptible to the environment? Try Florida. You're dealing with several trillion dollars in what's going to be a collapsing real estate market and then go right around the United States' borders. 1.5 trillion in student loans, one trillion in credit card debt, another trillion, 200 billion in car loan debt. And I'm not even talking about federal debt, state debt, uh, the uh, uh, bond market. I'm not talking about any of these other forms of debt. Altogether, it's 200 trillion. If the United States really cared about the environment, it would also care about its debt. We do not care about our debt. We do not care about sustainable currency holdings. 
a national effort to migrate or mitigate the worst consequences of climate change has to be paid for by somebody, yet the government can barely pay for the interest on its insane debt. And Trump's perverted tax cut promises the country will be dead in the water when global warming cascades into the catastrophic elements. So where will the tens of trillions be found to prepare the American public for the dismal future ahead in this Marshall Plan? It doesn't exist. Those who have built and profited most from the economic structures of the neoliberal regime are those who have brought upon us the climate crisis we face today. The elite's habit of consumption has desensitized them to harsh natural realities. Al Gore is an excellent example, a man who has sculpted his image as one of the planet's leading climate crusaders. Gore's Generation Investment Management, a London-based investment firm, co-founded by a former chief of Goldman Sachs, asset management David Blood, what an appropriate name, has made a killing on the speculation of putting a tax price upon carbon emissions. However, little of this has anything to do with actual getting rid of fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions. Gore is not an environmentalist. He is simply an exemplar of climate change capitalism as he flies around the world and his private jets and gives speeches to for hundreds of thousands of dollars and racking up monthly electric bills on his home at twenty two thousand, according to the National Center for Public Policy Research, our renewable energy champions own solar powered installation only accounts for six percent of his monthly energy consumption, which is twenty one times that of the average American family. And the average American family uses an appalling share of the world's resources. Americans consume 25% of the world's energy with only 4% of its population. The professional class has grown ex exponentially and its members now occupy most of the power positions in the country. Their lifestyle is one of their excessive consumption. And this con consumption is integral to their self-concept. How will they show everyone they've made it in life if they aren't surrounded by all the nicest stuff? To stop consuming is unthinkable. Who in this group of 181 men will volunteer to lower their standard of living in order to set a good example for their peers, for their country, for the world? These people do not make sacrifices. They do not ever give up their vote in a duopoly. They don't vote for Jill Stein, Ralph Nader, Rocky Anderson as they could. No. They have been responsible for the largest epidemic of overweight and obese children and toddlers, the largest medical bill in world history, consuming 17% of our gross domestic product, more people engaged in more speculative investments than before 2008 with derivatives and hedge funds, corporations kept on life support with families while families are foreclosed upon, private prisons bringing back the once unthinkable concept of debtors' prisons. So... This leaves us with a bleak impression for the future. Perhaps this is the most we can expect, looking to the elite to side with humanity in order to prevent a global climate catastrophe. If so, we are in dire straits. Gore and his ilk should never be counted upon as inspiring examples to lead an effective climate Marshall Plan. When we look at the potential leaders who could advance such a plan? All we find are greedy Wall Street and Silicon Valley firms ready to make more money off the next green technology. Obama may have started an organic garden on the White House property, but he still signed the Dark Act to protect Monsanto and the chemical agricultural industry's profits from states passing legislation to label genetically modified foods. Such is the utter hypocrisy of our national policymakers. It is a futile to pray for an epiphany to awaken the corporate elite and our legislators from their insatiable need to acquire more stuff. Can we expect the commanders of finance and the industry to give up their all of their Kobe meats and vintage wines? No, it's not going to happen. Their family to give up their, their gold-plated lifestyle? No. 
Is it unreasonable to expect them to have as much concern and shed a tear for the dying mothers and children in Yemen, Palestine? No, they don't shed a tear for anything unless unless they've lost something, like money. For the elite, deaths associated with wildfire, superstorms, tornadoes, flash floods are the new collateral damage, an unfortunate necessity to keep the fossil fuel marching along. So in conclusion, in the meantime, we are spiraling downwards with the clock ticking. Whether it's a dozen years to fundamentally turn our energy consumption around, as the conservative IPCC report allows, or the more realistic and independent and honest analysis giving us five to seven years or less, the time is rapidly approaching when nothing can be done. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing will matter. Nothing you will do will make a difference. Party affiliation, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, or Green will make absolutely no difference. Global warming doesn't align with political ideologies. Nor do superstorms, floods, droughts, and wildfires give a rat's buttocks for human hubris and our illusions about any divinely ordained exceptionalism. The framing of climate change trends in the future depends entirely upon human beings and our consumption and psychological behaviors. We either harness our knowledge and resources or we don't. So where are the wise humans in higher positions of authority and policymaking to grasp the reins of National Climate Change Initiative? They do not exist. They're out shopping. I'm Gary Knoll. Read the entire article by going to prn.fm. And this Sunday at noon, I'm going to do a two to three hour special on how to prepare for climate change, what to do before disaster strikes. There is still time for those who care enough to be prepared. Go to prn.fm if you'd like information on that. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you all for listening. Don't forget, this Sunday noon, a very powerful, upbeat, and constructive uh, what to do before disaster strikes. Best places to live and most safest as well. Go to PRN.FM. Have a nice day.